Hello and welcome to Bethel Church Online. I'm Pastor Michael and thank you for choosing to join us today. Today is the fifth week in our series, Living on Purpose, where we are learning God's path for us during times of uncertainty. Again, it's great to have you here. Now join with us in worship.
Welcome to Bethel Church. If this is your first time, let us know by sending an email to hello at Bethel.org. We've even got a Starbucks gift card just for you. Join us in the Zoom lobby after service by clicking the link in the chat. We look forward to connecting with you. Bethel Church is scheduling a week of fasting and prayer on October 25th through the 30th. Plan now to pray with us and consider how you could fast during those dates. Bethel Church is interested in hearing from you regarding how you and your family are doing during the COVID-19 pandemic. A survey is available on Bethel.org for you to complete over the next few weeks. Remember, inviting others to both online and drive in church is one of the easiest invitations you'll ever make. Use your favorite social media to like, share, subscribe, and invite others. As we transition into a time of offering, we want to thank you for your continued support and faithful giving. You can continue to make a difference by giving on one of these three ways. The first one is online at Bethel.org slash give. The second is through our church center app. And the third is through text. Just text the amount you would like to give to the number 84321 and press send. It's that simple. Thank you again for your generous donation. If you have any questions about any announcement I've just shared, send us an email to hello at Bethel.org and a friendly staff member will help you. Now let's welcome Pastor Frank as he comes to share with us the fifth message in our series, Living on Purpose. Well, hello and welcome to Bethel Online, both San Jose and our Santa Clara campuses. Big shout out to you, all of you who are guests. Thanks for taking some time to tune in today. Uh, depending on uh, when you're tuning in, we're just getting uh, all ramped up for drive-in church as well at both San Jose and Santa Clara, or we're just wrapping it up. Either way, we're just glad that you're here. I want to mention again about a time of prayer and fasting that kicks off next Sunday. It's going to be a prayer outline for you next Sunday. It's going to be a super important time. Also want to give a big shout out to Pastor Tom Witt, just turned 90 last Thursday. Pastor, we love you. We wish you a wonderful, happy birthday. And finally, don't forget about Trunk or Treat. You can sign up, be a part of it. We want lots of people to decorate their trunks, their boats, their motorcycles. You can sign up for San Jose. You can sign up for Santa Clara. You can sign up for both. But it's going to be an awesome time to be able to share and show the light of Jesus uh, to our community on that day. And a big shout out to all of you that came out yesterday to stuff thousands of bags of candy. So one of my favorite stories, can't remember if I told it here or not, but if I have, it's worth repeating about a pastor who was on vacation in Pennsylvania and it was the Pocono Mountains and it was in the hot dog days of summer and it's, and, and, and he went to church on vacation and, and he showed up at a local church and it's just hot and it's just, it, it felt like uh, the day was just droning on as that pastor was speaking. It just felt like, man, he's, I mean, he's looking around. And he's saying he's losing his audience. He's losing his audience. And then all, I mean, eyes are glazing over. And all of a sudden, this pastor just in a booming voice yells out to his congregation. And the best years of my life have been spent in the arms of another man's wife. Well, everybody's awake now. They've gasped. They can't believe what they've just heard. And then he goes on and he goes, that was my mother. You know, the best years of my life and the man of another man's wife. Well, my, my mother, well, they're relieved to say the least and everybody chuckles. But the vacationing pastor goes, oh, I need to tuck that one away. So fast forward a year. He's preaching in his own church. And it's one of those hot, lazy days, man, summer Sundays, and he's losing people and eyes are glazing over. And, and, and finally, he remembers from a year ago when he was visiting that church in the Pocono Mountains. And so he just decides he's going to pull the story out impromptu. And he lets out in a booming voice, the best years of my life have been spent in the arms of another man's wife. Well, his congregation, they gasp, they sit up straight. I mean, you know, he's got, he's got their attention now and he knew he had them. But then he said, I forgot what came next in the story. And in a moment of panic, all I could say was, and for the life of me, I can't remember her name. Um, I love that story. It's important to get the story right. It's important. You and I can have the best of intentions, but if 
if we don't get the story right, we end up spreading the wrong message. And we continue in this teaching series that we've been in now for several weeks, Living on Purpose. We're learning how to cooperate with God's spirit and his strategy to bring about his mission, both in our lives, God has a mission for your life, but also through our lives. He wants us to become more like his son, and then he wants us to help people everywhere to become more like his son, or in other words, become disciples of Jesus, neighborhoods and nations, ev ev everywhere. And I've been saying it for weeks now in this series, but the colossal challenge to this, and if you didn't hear the very first teaching that I did in this series, I encourage you to go back and listen to it. Um, we're in a spiritual war. There's, there's a war in an unseen world that the Bible's very clear about. It's very real. Just because we don't see it doesn't mean it isn't real. It's a spiritual war. It's with an unseen adversary who pushes against the mission, who pushes against what God wants to do in our lives and in the world, who pushes uh, against it. And furthermore, we don't fight like the world fights. It's so easy to fight like the world fights. Just return ugliness for ugliness. It's almost natural. But if I'm a follower of Christ, I don't get to do that. I charge the darkness, you charge the darkness a whole different way. And we're learning what that looks like to charge the darkness in these last days. We learn from the first church in Acts chapter 2. God's presence, His Spirit is poured out on them. And then you begin to see them live on purpose. And you see them adopting these certain behaviors, these key, what I call building blocks to living on purpose. And it's a 5G life because they all start with G. And we've been walking through them. We gather in healthy community. We grow as disciples. We grow up in our faith. We give back in service for Jesus' sake. We go as witnesses. We glorify God always. It always points back to him. It's always about him. These are core behaviors of a disciple. And today we continue with go as um, a witness. Go as a witness. Of Jesus. Now remember again, and if you have your Bibles, you might want to turn there real quick, but, but Acts chapter 1, the disciples are asking a prophecy question of Jesus. When are you going to come and basically set up the rule of Israel? In other words, when are you going to over, overthrow Rome and set up Israel's uh, kingdom? Jesus' answer, and again, I'm not going to turn there, but it, it's interesting. In verses 7 and 8, he says, it's not for you to know the times and the seasons which the Father has already established by his own authority. Uh, don't, don't worry about it. But he says, but you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you'll be my witnesses. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, ends of the earth. Witness. Uh, that Greek word there can translate witness or martyr. Well, what's a, what's a martyr? A martyr is somebody who dies for their cause. They give their life for the mission. That's Jesus's point. Maybe not physically die for the mission, though many have but give your life away to me and the mission. In other words, be all in. In other words, I'm no longer, if I'm a construction worker and, and I'm a follower of Jesus, I'm no longer a construction worker. Now uh, I'm a, a witness who is a construction worker. If I'm an engineer or a business owner or a CEO or a soccer mom or dad or a, or a landscaper, whatever it might be, now I'm a witness who is also those things. Never off the clock, been saying that. Yeah, you're always an ambassador. We always represent him. Remember Matthew 28, the Great Commission, right? Verse 19. Go. Go make disciples of all nations. Make disciples. Just one word in the Greek. It means to bring a pupil into a relationship with the teacher. That's the key. Bringing them into a relationship with the teacher. That teacher is Jesus. And I like to say it this way. It's making friends for eternity. It's a lifestyle. We can't go physically to all nations, path ethnos, all ethnicities, all people groups, all races. But we can send people to all nations. And of course, that's the heart of missions, which we get that at Bethel Church. We pray, we give, we go so that all nations have a shot at becoming a disciple. And I'll just put a bug in your ear right now. It's a month away, Mission Sunday. Mission Sunday, November 15th. I think it is going to be a really cool day. 
a really cool day. Not only are you going to have an opportunity to watch and listen to an interview I did with Hal Donaldson, who was the founder and the president of Convoy of Hope, an amazing organization, but Convoy is bringing us free of charge a semi tractor trailer load of of non-perishable foods, non-perishable foods. And we are on Mission Sunday gonna feed our neighbors. Um, one of the stats, a few of the stats that are coming out right now in the county and in the city is because of the lockdown, they're estimating at least 15,000 more homeless people in our community. And they are even saying thousands more who are suffering from food shortages so we're going to be a part of the solution and we're going to take and unload and we're going to feed our neighbors that day but here's the cool thing we're not going to just feed our neighbors we're going to feed nations and we're going to receive on november 15th a one day to feed the world offering one day to feed the world offering for convoy of hope convoy of hope does amazing things all around the world what one of the things they do is feed about 330,000 kids every single day in about 11 or 12 nations what is one day to feed the world? It's real simple and everybody can be a part of it. You give one day's wage. What do you make a day? Give one day's wage away so that kids and families in some of the most destitute places on earth can have hope every day. I've been to some of those places abroad. It's an amazing way to make a difference in the lives of kids and families. We're gonna feed on November 15th neighbors and nations. We're gonna be showing video, videos over the next few weeks from Convoy of Hope. You're gonna be seeing those each week uh, leading up to November 15th, and then we will receive that one day to feed the world. And I just wanna to say to our church family, to Bethel family, this is above our tithes, this is above other offerings. Laura and I give to missions every month. We tithe every month. Our one day to feed the world is gonna be above that. That offering is gonna be above that. So I just encourage us to get ready. I realize some of you can give far more than one day's wage, which is awesome. If God leads you that way. Uh, please do. But let's all of us give at least one day's wage to help people have hope every day. Bethel Church, we understand not only do we go, not only do we send others to go, but we also understand when it comes to the ends of the earth, they've come to Silicon Valley. I've talked about this before. And it's easy to look around in our valley. It's easy to watch people on the roads and in the high tech companies and oil companies and others that are headquartered here and think nobody cares about Jesus. Nobody cares about the gospel. They don't care about that stuff. For the most part, it's a post-Christian culture, which is true. But it's not true that people don't care. The majority of people in America, especially in our cities, don't know about Jesus. They actually don't know what the gospel means. Now, they know religion. They may know about a church. They know rule keeping, you know, people who are rule keepers. They might know a Christian who maybe attends church and serves in their community, and that's great. But there are far, far more people that are less informed about who Jesus is and what he actually came to do. Let me give you an example. Every person knows what it feels like to have the, the feeling of incompleteness. Incompleteness. There's a longing that's in us. And we're not even always sure what it means. But it's there and it doesn't mean we don't enjoy life. It doesn't mean we don't take great vacations. It doesn't mean we don't enjoy our family. It doesn't mean any of that. It's just a longing. That's what it is. There's this income. Things aren't complete. Now, the Bible speaks to this a lot, not in that language, but it speaks to it a lot. Romans 8 in the letter of Romans is one of the great places where it speaks very clearly. And it says there is a groaning in us all. There is a longing in us all. Hey, it's not just in humans. It's in the cosmos. It's in creation itself. It's in, there is in everything. There is this longing. We know the world isn't okay. You can be an atheist and still recognize that. So what do we long for? Well, what we really long for is renewal. 
Now, we don't use that language. We would say we long for our life and our world to be better. Who would disagree with that? Like, who would say, I don't want it to be better? Nobody would do that. We long for justice. We want wrongs to truly be corrected. We long for mercy. We want to be free from labels in our old past, our past, and other things that keep us from what's best today and moving forward today. We want to be free from that stuff. That's part of the work of mercy in somebody's life. We long for peace. We long for hope that what's broken can be restored. It can be better. It can be renewed. And not only do we want that renewal now, we want it to last forever. Why wouldn't we? Why would we want a renewal that could be taken away? Why would we want it to be taken away? We want it forever. Romans chapter 8 in the scripture says all creation groans. Earthquakes, fires, tsunamis. You can go down. The, the earth itself groans. We all groan. And then John a disciple of Jesus in his gospel account in the in the book of John, he comes along and he says about Jesus in chapter one in verse 14, and the word was made or became flesh. The word, logos, this life-giving, life-saving, life-redeeming and restoring word became flesh. He took on humanity and he dwelt among us and we have seen his glory. John was an eyewitness. He was there. We've seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son from the father. Here it is, full of grace and truth, full of grace and truth. Why is this so important to understand? Grace and truth is the remedy to the incompleteness that we sometimes feel, the groanings, the longing that sometimes we experience deep in our gut. You see, grace is God's power or his provision to bring a complete and permanent renewal. We can't do that on our own. If we could do it on our own, our world would be renewed today. You wouldn't have those longings. If we could pull it off, it would be pulled off by today. We can't. So grace is the power to see that incompleteness become complete and to remedy the groanings, bring renewal, transformation, change. Truth, so grace and truth, right? Great Truth is the picture of renewal. Grace is the power. But truth is a picture. There is a, there is a picture, and it's, uh, this picture is what renewal is, what completeness is in our lives. You can't get there any old way. There has to be a picture that satisfies the longing in our lives. Jesus, who is full of grace and truth, is both the power and the picture of complete and a forever life. So how do we who know Jesus already be his witnesses of this incredibly good news that most people in America don't even understand? In fact, I would venture to say, maybe not a majority, but a good, a good amount of people in church don't understand this. They've never been taught this. Yet it is central to the gospel of Jesus Christ. How do we do it? How do we make friends for eternity? I want to leave you briefly with three takeaways out of John's gospel account, chapter four. So if you have it on a smart device or you got your Bible with you, let's turn to John chapter four, making friends for eternity. It's a powerful, powerful scene about the attitudes and the actions of a witness. If you're a follower of Jesus, you are a witness. So here are some attitudes and actions. It's the story that Jesus encounters with a woman at the well. Let's look at a few verses, verses three through nine. So he, that is Jesus, left Judea, went back once more to Galilee. Judea's here, Galilee's up here. Now he had to go through Samaria. That's a really interesting phrase. You'll see in a minute. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar near the plot of ground where Jacob, one of the, the 
uh, patriarchs, Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, it's the middle of the day, hot, man, it's hot, and he sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. Verse nine, the Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. That is an understatement. In this encounter, Jesus confronts 700 years of accepted racial, social, and religious prejudice. 700 years of it. Jesus violates serious rules when it comes to being a teacher or a rabbi. And his encounter with this woman offers us three ways to think about people who do not yet know God, who have not experienced this encounter, this, ex this experience of their longing being fulfilled in Jesus. And one day it'll be fulfilled permanently. Three ways to think about them, that, that person, three ways to respond. I want us to look at both today. So great, three actions, three attitudes, okay? Making friends for eternity. Number one, I'm in your outline. There is an outline today. You can go, if you're on Facebook, uh, there should be a link there on our website, Bethel.org slash live. Uh, it is under notes. And so I hope that you'll go there and I hope you'll utilize this outline because I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on these, but I hope that you'll take our discussion question, discussion questions and that you'll Talk with others this week and go a little bit deeper in this subject matter. Okay, number one, view people as significant to God. That's the attitude Jesus shows us. View people as significant to God. Here's the action. Start by accepting them. Start by accepting them. This scene illustrates the reach and the depth of God's love for people. I cannot, I cannot exaggerate it. I cannot overstate it. The conflict with Jews and Samaritans in the ancient world, again, 700 years, deep, deep roots. Jewish people routinely traveled around Samaria to go to Galilee, even though it was long and you're walking because they didn't want to touch the soil of Samaria. And Jesus says, I've got to go there. I've got to go there. Jesus was a teacher, he's a rabbi, he's Jewish, she's a woman. Some strict rabbis in his day, they didn't even speak to their own wives in public because they thought it made them more noble. Not only is she a Samaritan, not only is she a woman, she has a, a questionable reputation. Uh, Jacob's well is outside of Sychar where she lived. It's not in her town. The only reason you go out of town in the heat of the day, it's noon, to draw water when people drew water in the morning before the sun got hot or in the evening. The only reason you went out of town at noon to draw water is because you weren't accepted in town. And we know that to be true. It was easier to avoid the embarrassment, the shame and the criticism of others. Uh, what an incredible statement of worth that Jesus makes towards this woman. Uh, the late Scottish scholar, New Testament scholar, Dr. William Barclay, brilliant, said of this scene, this is what he said. Here is God so loving the world, not in theory, but in action. God views all people as significant, people we don't agree with, people we don't like, and people who are different from us. In verse 9, she says, how can you ask me for a drink? She's saying, are, are, are you crazy? You're a Jewish teacher. How, how can, it's illegal in Jewish religious culture. The truth is Jesus showed acceptance all the time. He didn't show approval. If you're a follower of Christ today, never confuse the difference between acceptance and approval. They're not the same. They're not the same in the Bible. He constantly showed acceptance. What does that mean? I meet people where they're at. I love them where they're at. Didn't mean I approve but I love them where they're at. Jesus showed acceptance to people who were considered unacceptable in his world. Jesus was called names. You're a glutton, you're a drunk, and you're a friend of sinners. That's what the religious community said to him. Today, he would be called the friend of partiers, parolees, and power brokers who are far from God. That's the kind of names it would be labeled. Luke 15, one, one and two. Now tax collectors and sinners, tax collectors had their own category of sin. They were horrible. 
They were horrible. They were extortionists. Matthew, like the guy who wrote the Gospel of Matthew, was a tax collector. The guy was awful before he met Jesus. Awful. He was a tax collector. They were extortionists. Now, tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees, religious leaders, and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and he eats with them. Everyone comes to Jesus the same way, as is. I don't care who you are. It's true for me, it's true for you. As is. That doesn't mean that we approve. It doesn't mean that we condone things. God doesn't approve of all we do, but he does accept us through his son. Can I remind some of us who have been in church a while of the old hymn that has some great theology in them. Billy, uh, Billy Graham used it for years and years, just as I am without one plea. Not just as I hope to be, now just as I'm planning on being, not that I, just as I will be one day, just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou biddest come to thee. Thou biddest me to come to thee. Jesus is a first stepper. He's the one who says, come to me. Come to me. Thou biddest me come to thee. O Lamb of God, I come. You might want to post this today. If someone is stuck in the dark, keeping them away from the light isn't going to help them. It is truly amazing that notorious, godless, do my own thing, my own way sinners felt accepted around Jesus. They gathered around Jesus him. Number two, view people as separated from God. That's the attitude. View people separated from God. Speak what advances the conversation. So that's the action. Speak what advances the conversation. Jesus was absolutely masterful at this. He didn't leave people where they were at. He had a plan for their life. And you see this exchange in the woman at the well. Jesus didn't look at people merely and see their actions. He saw their actions, but not just their actions. He saw their deepest needs also. It's really easy to forget a profound truth that's recorded in Romans chapter 6, verse 23. It reads this way. For the wages of sin is death or separation, comma, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Everyone you knew, everyone you know, everyone you see, the same is true for me, lives on one side of that comma. One side or the other. They live on one side or the other, a Romans 6.23 comma. They're either separated or connected with God. Every day, life and death hangs in the balance. Every day. Jesus did not see this woman through racist eyes, though many did. He did not see her through religious eyes, social or cultural eyes. He saw her with eternal eyes. Eternal eyes. John 4 13 and 14, Jesus replied, anyone who drinks this water will become thirsty again. But those who drink the water that I give will never thirst again. It becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. It is amazing to me how the hearts of hurting people soften when we take the time to advance the conversation. Jesus didn't go into the long, sordid, 700-year history of why Jews and Samaritans hate one another. He just asked her about, his life, about her life. He cared about her. Her story and her heartache came out. And then he advances the story to living water. What does that mean? Well, it's a, here it means it's a metaphor for, for Jesus as the answer to the ache. He, he's the answer to the incompleteness in your life and mine. He, he, he is that answer. Number three, view people as searching for a savior. View people as searching for a savior. You heard me right. Sometimes folks don't want their, they don't know what they're searching for, but they're searching. View people as searching for a savior. That's the mindset. That's the attitude. Here's the action. Assist them in their spiritual journey. 
just be there for them, assist them. <clears throat> my, my sister sent me a story. It's pretty funny. It's titled The 100 Mile an Hour Goat. <clears throat> it's a metaphor for life. It goes like this. There are a couple of guys that are out hunting. They come across this huge hole. I mean, it's cavernous hole in the ground. Goes down for who knows how long. And the first hunter turns to the second hunter and says, man, I wonder just how far down this hole goes. It's absolutely enormous. Well, the second hunter turns to his buddy and he says, well, let's drop something in the hole and let's see how long it takes before it hits, hits the bottom. So the first hunter turns around and he says, well, here's an old car transmission. Help me pick up the transmission and we'll, we'll, we'll drop it in the hole and we'll count and we'll see how long it takes. So they do. They pick it up, they drop it in the hole, and then they, they count. One, 1,000, two, 1,000, three, 1,000. All of a sudden, as they're listening and, and looking over, over into the hole, they hear rustling behind them. They hear a lot of rustling, and, and just as they turn around, they see this goat come blasting through the brush. I mean, he's crashing through the brush, and he runs up to the hole without hesitation, jumps head first into the hole. Well, that's weird. They're looking at each other going, what was that about? They're trying to figure it out. All of a sudden, old farmer walks through the brush and he asks him, hey, guys, by the way, have you seen my goat around here? Well, the first hunter says, it's so strange that you would ask that because, I mean, just a minute ago, this goat comes flying through the brush. And I mean, he's doing 100 miles an hour and he jumps head first into this hole. And the, whole, and the old farmer, he says, well, that's impossible because I had him chained to a transmission. Now, it's kind of a funny story, but that scene is also a metaphor for life. Sometimes, some of us are like those hunters. We're just clueless. We're clueless on what's on the other side of the chain. Some of us, sometimes, may even be like the farmer who wraps chains around the necks of others. But you know what I know to be true? We've all been the goat. We've all been the goat. You don't have to live long on planet Earth to be stung or hurt by others, either accidentally or deliberately. And it was certainly true of the Samaritan woman and her story. As you read on her story in John 4, and I hope you read it all, she'd been married five times, and the guy she's with right now isn't her husband. She's been ostracized from her community, yet Jesus assists her in her spiritual journey. Verses 22 through 26 of John 4, you Samaritans worship what you don't know. We worship what we do for salvation comes from the Jew. True. Verse 23, yet, yet a time is coming and has now come when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers that the Father seeks. Verse 24, God is spirit and he worships must be, uh, and worship must, and worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. In other words, anybody can come and worship. Let it be in spirit and truth. She says, well, I know that Messiah, called the Christ, is coming. So she knew the Old Testament scriptures. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Jesus says in verse 26, then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. This is one of the few times where Jesus is crystal clear about who he is as the Son of God. There are hundreds of hurts, hundreds of pains that both we cause and that are caused by others. And all of it reminds us that, that things are not as they should be in life. They remind us that things are incomplete. They're incomplete. There is a world of people who are thirsting for something more. There is a world of people who are searching for something more. The early church father, Augustine, 
another guy that was just a sexual deviant before he came to God, became one of the great thinkers of all time. Augustine said, our hearts remain restless, incomplete. Our hearts remain restless until they find their rest in thee. People are searching for a savior. They may not know it, but they're searching for a savior. They're searching for someone who is full of grace and truth. Someone who has the power to change what is broken and then a picture of it, truth. And you know, it takes people who are available who have already drank from the living water. They've already experienced it. I mean, they're, we're all in a journey. None of us are, 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 are perfect. We're not there yet. But we've experienced the living water. And they just need someone to show them where to find that living water for themselves. In just a moment, the worship team is going to come back up. And we're going to worship. And I pray that you make this next song a declaration for your life. But let me just say this, Bethel Church. People are more open than we may think to an invitation to connect. An invitation over coffee. An invitation to a motorcycle ride. An invitation to a round of golf, to a church service or event like our trunk or treat. It's a great opportunity, not only to serve and give back, but to invite. People are more open than you might think to a get together in part of our life group. Be surprised. Offering assistance to others is putting wheels to my words. It's the work of loving people who don't yet know God. Those separated from him. And the truth is, this world needs Jesus. This world needs Jesus. May every heart turn to him. Let's worship, then I'll come back and I'll close this in prayer.
Jesus. And I know this heart needs healing. So from my knees I lift this prayer to you, my Savior. For my life and for the world, you're the answer, Jesus. Lord, it's our prayer today that every heart would know you. When we look at what's happening in our world today, it is a stark reminder of the incompleteness that we see everywhere. But the truth is, we're all searching for the same thing. We're all thirsting for the same thing. We're, 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 we're thirsting for something that can bring completeness, that could, that could that can remove the groaning and the longing in our life. And you are that something, you are that someone. And I pray, Lord, that even though we don't always get it right as followers of yours, may we be people who are willing to take steps towards others and be that example and be that encouragement and be that loving example of yours. I pray for that today, and I pray for the ones that long for something more and they don't know what it is. They don't know what they thirst for. And friend, if that's you today, I just invite you to consider, to explore the claims of Christ, to explore the claims that Jesus made about himself. I am that living water, he said, that wells up into eternal life. Those are pretty bold words. He is what you and what I and everybody else is actually searching for. Invite him in. Invite him in. Invite him in in this moment. Just say, pray, Jesus, I come to you just as I am, just like that song I quoted. Just as I am. That's the only way I know how to come. Just as I am. Come into my life. Forgive me for living my life apart from you. And then help me, help me to live a renewing life life, a life that is being renewed. And one day it'll be complete, friend. One day this world will be complete. He'll come back. He'll set it all right. Help me to live a renewing life today. If you prayed that prayer, it's so important that you let us know at Bethel, hello at Bethel.org. And, and, and our host will talk more about that, but hello at Bethel.org. Let us help you with your spiritual journey. So appreciate you tuning in today. Don't forget about uh, just signing up and serving, giving back through Trunk or Treat. It's going to be a great week. Don't miss as we wrap up this series next Sunday. Make sure you invite somebody to come. God bless you, and thanks for tuning in today. If you just prayed that prayer, let us know. Send an email to hello at Bethel.org. Also, join us in the Zoom lobby by clicking the link in the chat. We would love to meet you and help you get connected at Bethel Church. Again, we know that now more than ever, people are searching for community and connection. So we encourage joining a life group. Here at Bethel, we have many life groups. Visit Bethel.org slash life groups to discover groups for women, men, young adults, support groups, and more. Don't forget to invite others to join us online or for our drive-in service. Your invitation matters and it's the easiest invitation you'll ever make. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope to see you again next week for part six of our series, Living on Purpose.